Welcome to the General's Gentlemen. I've played The Company of Heroes 3 multiplayer pre-alpha extensively over the last week. It has some incredible foundations, but its current state has major issues. The design is superb. The two factions and battle groups, which is what they now call commanders, are designed more elegantly than all the other existing factions throughout the franchise, boasting a much richer strategic diversity. However, the pre-alpha was very rough and janky to play. Balance, performance, stability, pathing, collision, and the presentation, as well as many mechanics, are currently lacking and substantially limit the game's enjoyability. Many of these issues will be fixed before launch, but the question is, how much and how well? First of all, I believe Relic's approach with Company of Heroes 3 was the right one, and the Mediterranean theater makes the most sense. Not only are Italy and Africa underrepresented fronts in World War II media, but they're perfect for fostering the combined arms playstyle where Company of Heroes shines. As cool as the Pacific theater would be, it doesn't make sense for the franchise. You can't have heavy tanks battling it out on Iwo Jima or Midway, and trying to implement a melee system would be a nightmare. So I'm happy with the setting, but I'm disappointed by the second Axis faction, which appears to be merely more Germans rather than a proper Italian faction. This can be demonstrated by some extracted game files, which suggest that it'll be the Deutsches Afrika Corps. I also believe that Relic have taken the right approach to their overall design philosophy by not reinventing the wheel. It's fantastic how integral community participation has been to their development since the beginning, and it clearly shows. Co3 is not very innovative, but it iterates by combining elements from Company of Heroes 1 and 2. I'm glad that Co3 plays it safe, unlike Dawn of War 3, because if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Though Company of Heroes 3 isn't entirely a rehash of the old, as it does add some excellent new mechanics into the mix. These include vehicle side armor, elevation bonuses, deeper battle group trees, and an additional mini sub-faction branch for each faction, such as the field marshals for Wehrmacht and the regiments for the US forces. Tank side armor is the most welcome, as it makes tank battles more tactical. I also love the combinations of the regiments and field marshals, along with the branching paths of the battle groups, as it creates some interesting, mutually exclusive options and combinations. However, the combinations can be confusing and superfluous, especially for the US forces. For example, there's the Airborne Battle Group, which gives air support such as recon planes and strafing runs, but the Airborne Regiment also grants additional strafing runs. The system needs more fleshing out, but I like its idea. The high ground bonus is a little more complicated, as its success will depend on the map design. Initially, I was concerned about the high ground potentially making combat too campy and defensive but it appears to be sparse in the map design. The 1v1 map, Twin Beaches, for example, contains only a single sector where the height advantage is particularly relevant. This raised area at the south of the map is located near some resources, but does not contain any itself. Keeping troops there on the high ground can help defend the area, but alone it's insufficient to prevent the enemy from flanking around and capturing the nearby territory. So this is a good implementation. However, one of the 2v2 maps in the pre-alpha, Aire Perennius, is a choke pointy camp fest, partially due to the height advantages overlooking key areas. The elevation mechanic seems comparable to deep snow and ice in Company of Heroes 2. Tanks sinking on the ice in Co2 is fun, at least in the current map pool, because it's used sparingly and it creates trade-offs about mobility. Whereas deep snow was so widespread during KOTU's early days that it was overly obnoxious and ended up getting removed. So it'll remain to be seen by KO3's map designers if elevation adds to the game rather than subtracting from it and just being frustrating. KO3 mostly reverts to the resource system of KO1, 
with munitions and fuel points that vary in guild, such as low, medium, and high. There's also empty strategic points that serve merely as cutoffs to connect the more valuable regions. The Co1 system is undoubtedly more complex than Co2 and gives more room for map makers to make detailed maps. But I also think the Company of Heroes 2 resource system is fine, so I wouldn't have minded which direction they went. The only aspect of the resource system that bothers me in Co3 is that they didn't revive the capturing system from Co1. Capturing in Co3 works the same as in Co2, where a squad only needs to be inside of a capture circle to capture it automatically. This passive capturing system allows infantry squads and even support weapons to take cover and engage the enemy while capturing. Likewise, engineer units can plant mines and build sandbags even while capturing with no downside. Capturing was more strategic in the original Co-1 system as it required a squad to actively capture a region, leaving them vulnerable to attack and creating a timed opportunity cost of constructing fortifications. Co-3 also introduces specific capture units, the Kettenkrad for Wehrmacht and the Scout Squad for USF. These cheap and mobile units have either weak or no combat ability, but they can capture territory rapidly. They seem too vital at the moment, but I think they're a nice addition, especially for the early game diversity. They force players to consider options, such as building a second scout squad for more map control or going for faster combat units to play more aggressively. The early game build order diversity is also heightened substantially by the access to battle group specific units from the beginning of the game. The armor and airborne battle groups can upgrade engineers and scouts into assault engineers and pathfinders respectively. Likewise, Wehrmacht can drop in Falschirm Pioneers at the start of the game. Co3 adds a higher level of strategy than the older Co games, which have more one-dimensional and on-the-rail faction design. Still, the faction design isn't perfect, and I do have some nitpicks. For example, I dislike how access to the anti-tank guns is now delayed until Tier 3 which means that they arrive later than even the light vehicles which can dominate the battlefield. It's also weird how all four of the standard Wehrmacht combat squads gain capture speed bonuses. Additionally, the battle group specific Fallschirmjäger squad are pretty pointless since Wehrmacht already get access to so many elite infantry squads. Regardless, Hopefully the two remaining factions, the British and I believe the Africa Corps, will also be as well designed as the US and the Wehrmacht. In both Co1 and Co2, the two original factions were the best designed, and then in contrast, the later expansion factions featured obnoxious asymmetric cheese mechanics that were very anti-fun and ended up requiring substantial reworks. But Co3 is unique in that for the first time in the franchise, it will launch with four factions rather than adding them later. Having all four armies at launch and with the centrality of community feedback, it should mean that the factions have a more consistent design direction and interact more gracefully. Hopefully this time we'll avoid the poor faction design consisting of asymmetric cheese features such as the forward bases in Co1 with the Brits and OKW in Co2, as well as intentionally making OKW overpowered in the late game. Co3 also addresses some of the design issues of Co2 to improve its gameplay. In particular, infantry snares have been heavily re-examined Panzerfausts and Sticky Bombs now only temporarily slow vehicles, rather than damaging their engine until repaired. As far as I can tell, these abilities only seem to damage engines if they're at low health, rather than the 75% threshold in Company of Heroes 2. I much prefer this new system because the power fantasy of controlling tanks was ruined by requiring your massive tiger tank to cowardly flee from a squad of little conscripts for fear of getting crippled. It's also weird how in Co2, tanks and Panzerschrecks never deal engine damage, yet Panzerfaust and anti-tank grenades always did. This inconsistency currently still exists in Co3, 
but now it's much less apparent. Grenades are also implemented much better because they're not as good at getting squad wipes. The CO2 style of grenades actually promoted blobbing because it punished players for trying to multitask and spread out their forces around the map because if a player looks away for two seconds, a grenade can quickly come in and instantly wipe the squad as they're clumped behind cover. CO3 also completely removed the abandoned mechanic. And I'm certainly glad because abandoned tanks added too much random chaos due to the unpredictable RNG that could heavily swing the outcome of a game. However, there are still some design issues in Code 2 that either have not been addressed or actually are reintroduced. Light vehicles can still dominate the early in the mid game and call in tanks ignore tech requirements and so they reign supreme as well as snipers have too much impact. Snipers remain unchanged in Co3. They're a fragile one-man squad who picks off enemies from afar with perfect accuracy. They have long sight range and they cloak in cover. So as always, they're very frustrating and unfun to be on the receiving end. This Co2 style of sniper is broken in concept and not merely a balance issue because their power varies enormously on skill level as their fragility sees them quickly gunned down due to player inattentiveness in low skill games. But top players who don't make mistakes can use the sniper's lethality to dominate the game. Too much of a game can revolve around trying to mitigate the sniper and it makes the game more passive and blobby. Additionally, the strength of this KOTU style sniper varies enormously on map type as open maps make their range invaluable and impossible to flank, yet while urban maps make them very vulnerable and easily caught out. Ultimately, there are much better potential implementations for sniper types of units, which sadly Co3 hasn't yet explored. And yet, that being said, the scout squads for USF already are functioning similar to a sniper unit. They're fragile with high damage at range and large sight range. So this overlap is quite weird and scouts are definitely a more fun, fair and balanced unit. So it's weird that we do still have the snipers in their current implementation. Personally, I also wish the game length was re-examined as matches that drag on for over an hour can be exhausting and tedious. I'd personally prefer it if victory points counted down faster or if they accelerated over time to reduce the game's length by about 15%. Company of Heroes I think shines in games about 45 minutes, but anything closer to an hour I think is just too much. A substantial change from Co2 is how the time to kill is slower in tank combat. I like this reduced lethality as it gives more room to respond and react. Whereas in Co2, the tank battles were usually decided before they even started. However, flanking doesn't quite feel rewarding enough at the moment, so perhaps rear armor shots should do bonus damage or cause engine criticals. However, the time to kill in infantry battles is a bit more complex to analyze, as it appears to have consistency issues. The forums are filled with people citing contradictory things about the infantry lethality. Riflemen and Grenadiers seem to take forever to kill each other, even at close range. However, once weapon upgrades come out, such as the bars for Riflemen or the light machine guns on the Falchion Pioneers, then infantry get shredded rapidly. Close combat squads like Engineers and Pioneers are devastating up close, and yet the anti-tank gun crews are incredibly durable. So there's definitely some oddities and it's easy to appreciate why people are complaining about the time to kill being both too low and too high. I also love how the machine gun and mortar teams are more deadly than in Co2 and it gives me the impression that Co3 is aiming for a higher infantry lethality. So I enjoy the higher lethality as it makes combat feel more realistic and exciting but there's definitely some tweaking and balancing needed, especially across the infantry, the AT guns and vehicles. The scale of Co3 is larger than previous games as the population costs of units are lower and the fuel cost of vehicles is cheaper. 
Consequently, players can easily field an army consisting of over 5 tanks on top of the other infantry and support weapons. Whereas in KO2, players rarely had more than 3 tanks each. And I think this addresses a design problem where preservation of a single tank was too important in KO2 and it took an extremely long time to replace if it was lost. This meant that RNG was more consequential and frustrating since so much depended on the impact of a single tank. The larger scale of army sizes in KO3 gives a more epic feeling to the late game tank combat and tank battles emphasize the tanks themselves instead of in KO2 where the supporting AT guns are more impactful. That being said, tank battles in KO3 are currently very unpleasant. Controlling vehicles feels awful, as they're sluggish, unresponsive, they handle poorly, and they easily get stuck on both terrain and each other. The larger scale sounds fun in theory, but currently I'm not able to appreciate it due to the state of the game. The visual scale also feels off, especially for vehicles. Not only is the zoom level higher, but tanks look smaller than in previous co-games relative to infantry and especially compared to the environment. The power fantasy of controlling tanks is ruined by them looking tiny compared to the enormous houses, so I think all vehicles should be rescaled about 15% larger. Tank combat also still suffers from the vehicle reverse move being the same speed as moving forwards. Aside from this clearly being unrealistic and arcadey, tanks reversing at turbo speed makes it difficult to flank around the sides and the rear. Weaker side and rear armor is hardly relevant if a heavy Tiger tank can rapidly reverse away from Shermans charging towards them at full speed. Having tanks reverse slower would substantially make tank positioning more tactical and encourage players to attack into enemy tanks if they're out of position. Especially given the larger scale of tank combat, KO3 is missing out on an opportunity to substantially improve the depth of tank combat by reducing reverse speed. Assigning different speeds for reverse and forwards was an engine limitation in previous KO games, and it may still be now in KO3, but I think it should have been something that they properly addressed this time from the beginning. KO3 is still a year out from launch, but for me, the game's presentation is a massive letdown. The art style is subjective, and responses vary, but personally I hate it. The brighter, more vibrant and colourful style makes the game look too cartoony and arcadey, which detracts from the World War II immersion fantasy of Company of Heroes. KO1 was gritty and dark, which perfectly matched the tone of the gameplay and the audio. The art style also creates issues of contrast, where readability is significantly impacted. Because of how bright and colourful everything is, it's difficult to distinguish units, especially infantry, from the environments. This readability issue, combined with the heightened zoom level, creates problems for trying to read really important animations, such as when infantry throw grenades. Currently, there's a progress bar that floats overhead of the infantry units when they throw a grenade, so it's trivial to see them and react now, but I assume that this weird floating progress bar is only a placeholder, and I certainly hope it's temporary because it looks really goofy. The banner art for KO3 is especially cartoony and goofy looking. For me, even KO2's art style and UI was already a step back for the series, as it went for less realism and more arcadiness. KO3 retains the ability to select an enemy machine gun or anti-tank gun team and see the precise boundaries of its firing arc. This removes the need to actually perceive the game world by looking at the units and thinking about positioning, as instead all you need to do is click on the enemy and look at the convenient range indicator overlay. Units should not provide so much information to enemy players as it takes away from the drama and tension of engagements. However, there are certainly some great things about the visuals of KO3. 
I love the new building destruction effects, where subsections of buildings are destroyed and collapse in a way that looks real. Co3 maps have lots of detail and rubble, so there's a greater feeling of destruction surveying the battlefield at the end of a match. Infantry animations also have more life to them than in Co2, as squads duck behind cover briefly after running up to it. Co2's infantry are overly stiff and gamey, so I'm glad there's more work being put into the infantry animations to make them more like soldiers and less like chess pieces. The heavy machine gun teams also look better than ever, as they have a squad member specifically carrying ammunition boxes. There's a lot of really cool detail being put into all the little things, so personally I find the overall cartoonier art style to be such a shame. The pre-alpha uses a lot of placeholder portraits and icons, but there are a lot of new portraits that unfortunately I think look really bad. These new portraits have a creepy uncanny valley vibe to them that I find really jarring, so I hope that they work more on those portraits. As for the audio, I find the voice acting is pretty hit and miss. Some units sound really cool, while others are pretty flat and some lines just sound weird. But it's the same as it has been in previous co-games, some units are just better than others. There are currently many placeholder sound effects from Co2, but the weapon effects and gunshots, including the new ones, just don't sound weighty and distinctive enough to make the game feel as epic and blood pumping as it should. I still find Co1 to have a substantially better collection of sound effects and voice acting than both Co2 and Co3. I wish that they would just reuse the best sound effects from Co1, but perhaps there are licensing issues preventing them from doing so. Either way, Co3's presentation will undoubtedly improve leading up to its launch next year, but still, I have little hope that Co3 will end up a better sounding title than previous Co games, and probably not better looking either, unless you prefer the more cartoony art style. In summary, Co3 has an incredible foundation, as the game design is superb, with factions much more detailed and varied than those in previous Company of Heroes games. Relic have taken the right approach, both in terms of the setting and their design process, which has relied heavily on community involvement. Co3 hardly innovates the franchise, but it adds some nice new mechanics, such as battle groups, regiments, side armor, and elevation. But much of the game's content is still unavailable, so the remaining factions and maps are required to give a more complete assessment. Co3 also fixes some of the design issues with Co2, such as the excessive vehicle snares on infantry squads and vehicle abandon. However, Relic have not yet addressed many inherited issues, such as snipers and tanks reversing at full speed. I like how the tank lethality is lower and the scale is larger, but it's not very fun given tanks janky and clunky control. Infantry and support weapon lethality seems higher, but it's currently not very fleshed out and needs more work. The presentation of Co3 is subjective, but personally I find it a big letdown. And I know it'll improve over time, but I don't think I'll like it as much as the previous games. In particular, the over bright and colourful art style makes it feel a more cartoony, and it's a massive departure from the grittier tone of Company of Heroes 1. Still, Co3's visuals have some excellent details, such as building destruction, infantry animations, and support weapon crew. Even though the game's current state can be difficult to enjoy, I'm very impressed and excited for Company of Heroes 3's launch, and I really appreciate Relic putting out such an early public multiplayer build. I hope its problems are properly fixed before launch, because I'm an insatiable Company of Heroes fiend, and I'll be binging Co3 when it comes out. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video review. If you played Co3's alpha, let me know what you think below in the comments. Blake and I will definitely be doing some casting for Co3 when it comes out, and hopefully if the beta has replays, then we'll do some casting for that as well. So stay tuned, and we'll see you then.